Well, that trio of ministers were close to a deal. As you say, Emily, it would be a 1% increase in national insurance contributions and a cap on care costs of £50,000. That was the upper limit proposed by Andrew Dilnot, and now this delay. Now, there are two broad reasons for that delay. Firstly, there's the practical problem that these three ministers are hors de combat. Sajid Javid, he's got COVID. Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak are self-isolating because they came into contact with him. Now, you would need a massive operation to launch something like this. You can't do it from one of their sort of bunkers. You'd need a parliamentary statement. You'd need visit to care homes and you'd need a, a big meeting of the 1922 committee. But there are also some political snags. As I understand it, talking to a people who are familiar with Sajid Javid's thinking, he very much wanted to spend the summer thinking about social care. He's only just become health secretary. There's a slight feeling that maybe he was being bounced. That challenges the idea that it was him and Boris Johnson ganging up on Rishi Sunak, the chancellor. The other political snag is that Rishi Sunak, a fiscal conservative, he instinctively wouldn't like tax rises, but I'm told under active consideration is the idea that yes, he would agree to this tax rise, but in exchange for that, the pension triple lock would no longer survive in its current form. And what are the MPs or the backbenchers saying or not saying about this, Nick? What are you... What are you Feeling. Well, the problem with a delay like this is that it allows MPs to gnaw at the details. I was speaking to one senior figure. They're talking about a backlash from colleagues who are very upset, upset that young people are going to have to pay for this. And this person is canvassing support for the idea that only people in their 40s and above would pay these extra national insurance contributions and also people who have reached state retirement age and are still working they're exempt from national insurance they would have to pay uh, under this idea but i was speaking to a one senior figure in government and they're really worried that this delay on this issue means that the government is storing up over a very short period of time in the autumn a massive number of very significant decisions there's covid there's the nhs catch up there's the move towards net zero there's the pension, triple lock and social care. Uh, and this uh, figure said to me, I will eat my hat if the Conservatives are at 35% in the polls by Christmas. Nick, thanks very much indeed. Well, that's, if you like, the politics of that decision or indecision to come. What about the economics of who actually pays and how? Here's Ben Chu. Economically, this has been a grossly unequal pandemic from the point of view of different generations. Younger people have suffered the most in the labour market and seen their education severely disrupted. Older people, on the other hand, although by no means all, have seen the value of their homes and also stocks and shares soar. And some fear another economic wedge could be about to be driven hard between the generations. The government is reportedly looking at financing a long-awaited and much-needed overhaul of adult social care, £10 billion a year, by increasing national insurance contributions. So what's the problem with this approach? The big thing you'd have noticed about national insurance contributions is that it's, it's not charged on people over the state pension age, either on their earnings, so if you're working and earning money, you don't pay nicks on that, on that money, um, or on pension, on pension in receipt. So if you choose to pay for social care with nicks, that's effectively a choice that means we're gonna pay for that social care based only on the working age. We already have in the system lower taxes on older people, so people over the state pension age, people working for their own businesses, and people who are getting investment incomes. And this would be a move that made that gap even bigger. The Resolution Foundation points out that a one pence rise in personal national insurance contribution rates would mean a 21-year-old earning £20,000 a year paying £104 more in tax a year. A 21-year-old earning £50,000 would pay an additional £404, whereas a 66-year-old, even one earning as much as £50,000 a year, would pay zero extra. Now, it's important to note that not all adult social care spending goes on the elderly. Around half goes on people of working age with disabilities. Nevertheless, the intergenerational element of this tax idea cannot be ignored, especially because the consequence of any cap on personal care contributions underwritten by the government would be this. The idea is that it would leave untouched the housing wealth of those with large care costs. You've sort of seen, I suppose, firsthand. This those who work with struggling young people are concerned. 
Yeah, absolutely. I've seen firsthand the difficulties that my younger relatives have had um, as they're wanting to start to move into work or move away from home. And it's just become impossible for them to do. I mean, there's often this belief that people won't notice a national insurance increase, but people aren't daft. They know what more money in their pay packet looks like, and they definitely know what it feels like. Um, any government that wants to um, rebuild our country after this terrible, terrible pandemic needs to make sure that young people are getting the support they need so that this um, recession doesn't create a really long-term burden for them. Further evidence that younger generations sense what's going on came today in a snap poll showing support for using national insurance hikes to pay for social care reforms is much lower among the under 50s than it is for those above that age. Among those aged 65 plus, those who wouldn't pay it, there was a 71% net approval. Among 25 to 49 year olds, there was just 11% net support. Now, it's possible the government will decide to levy any increase in national insurance taxes to pay for this reform on pensioners too. That might defray the generational impact of this proposal, yet it would not eliminate it. And most experts have a simple message for the government on social care reform. Look for another way of paying for it. That was Ben Chu. Well, joining us now, Sir Andrew Dilnot, who was commissioned to find a solution into long-term social care in 2011. Afterwards, we'll be joined by Viv Rayner from the National Care Forum and James Johnson, former pollster for Theresa May. Um, but, Sir Andrew, if we can start with you. And what we've heard today is that those reforms or that solution has been pushed back again by the sound of things, partly because of ministers self-isolating, partly because um, they clearly haven't come to a consensus yet. Um, what is your response to what you're hearing? Well, I suppose at one level, I don't mind too much exactly when things are announced. What I think matters most and is really critical is when things are actually done, when reforms are implemented. We have a social care system in this country that is something that as a, as a nation we, we simply can't be proud of. We're failing people at their most vulnerable and we need to sort it out. That's been necessary for decades. So exactly when the announcement's made, of course, I'd love it to be tomorrow. I'd love it to have been 10 years ago. Uh, I'm less worried about that. I'm more concerned about when uh, reforms are actually implemented. And if this is a delay that just takes us to the early autumn, then we can still get extra money into the means tested system next year we can still get the more structural reforms okay. done in a couple of years. Well, let's talk about the how then. That 1% rise on national insurance was a suggestion being mooted. We've just heard about the potential generational gap that opens up when you've got 21-year-olds paying um, £400 and a 66-year-old paying zero. Um, would you reject that as the solution? Well, uh, that's really not the solution to the social care problem. The social care problem is about how we spend the money, not how we raise it. So this is a question about how the money is raised. I'm in the end more interested in how it's spent, what it's spent on, spending on the most vulnerable, spending but on would the you workforce accept that, that have been neglected. We've, until we've worked out actually how you raise it, um, which is the political conundrum at the heart of this, there won't be any solution. Uh, I don't think it is the only. So I'll answer your question in a moment. I don't think it is the only political conundrum. I think the bigger political conundrums are actually about how it's spent on how the money is raised. I think there's a strong case to be made for making sure that however the money is raised, those over retirement age, as well as those under retirement age, make a contribution. As Ben Chu pointed out, about half of social care spending is actually on people of working age, not on the elderly and three quarters of all of us will in the end need social care but I certainly think it's it's entirely reasonable and appropriate that people over retirement age as well as under retirement age should pay towards this thing that so, will benefit many of us. So pensioners should pay too? I think pensioners who have enough income and wealth to pay should. Uh, one of the attractions of income tax, for example, is that income tax, which is paid by people regardless of their age, is paid st strictly taking into account people's income position. And so I don't think poor pensioners should pay for this. Uh, pensioners who have no income shouldn't be making a contribution. But I can't think of a very strong argument why a pensioner with a high income 
shouldn't contribute in much the same way as a, a person aged 50 with a you, high income. You, your suggestion um, 10 years ago was a cap, I think, of around 50,000 on individual contributions. I don't know whether that sum has changed. We saw with Theresa May um, her plan to allow for a floor, if you like, for people to pay for their care posthumously through property um, went politically disastrously wrong for her and the party. Yes, it did. And I think that's because it, it was in the end a misconceived idea. It failed to uh, provide risk pooling for the population as a whole. It, it addressed one issue, which we also addressed in our report 10 years ago. We argued for a flaw in the means tested system to move the from the position now where if you have wealth of more than £23,250, you get no help from the state. We suggested taking that up to a level of about £100,000. I think that's an important part of what needs to be done. But we do also need to produce a form of social insurance for mm -hmm. the population as a but, whole. That's where the cap comes in. That but isn't once the cap you've had... too blunt? I mean, I think it was Damien Green who said this is just too blunt an instrument. When you have a cap that is one set amount, um, then, of course, you're going to have other questions of inequality. Well, uh, there are certainly different ways of, of uh, putting the social insurance in place. But 10 years on from our report, I don't think anyone has come up with a more effective uh, and efficient way of doing it. I'm very happy if, if somebody can come up with a better way of delivering that social insurance to everybody. But I think that on the whole, there's pretty widespread agreement. This is the right direction to travel so in. That part of the proposals was in the manifestos of all three of England's what? major political parties in the run-up to the last election. Sir Andrew, what have we lost um, from not having had a solution in this decade, in your opinion? We, we, we've had generations of people who needed care and the families of people who needed care who have been let down. And we've had a huge workforce. We have one and a half million people working in social care, as many as work in the NHS, and they've worked in a sector that has been vulnerable, fragile, where they've been poorly paid, where they haven't been properly trained. We've just not done a good enough job of looking after ourselves when we're at a time of our greatest need. And that's a massive political failure that's gone on for decades and we really need to sort out now. Sir Andrew Dilnot, thank you very much indeed. Let's pick up um, with Vic Rayner then from the National Care Forum because you're at the coalface uh, of this problem. Vic, what, what does this kind of delay or any kind of delay mean for you and, and the people within your care? Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's just a, another series of frustrations, really. I mean, we, we've heard, you know, for the last couple of years that this government was intending to reform social care and we've heard this for decades, you know, previous to that. So I think there's there's a lot of frustration around that. But I, I would absolutely agree with uh, Sir Andrew that actually what we need to be talking about is what is the kind of social care system that we need to have. Prior to this government, we had two years, two and a half years of discussing a green paper, which was intended to outline what social care should look like. We haven't ever had that. So we haven't had the proper debate about what kind of social care we need now. And absolutely, most importantly, what we're going to need for the future. Why do you think we're sort of squeamish about this? Well, I think I think part of the challenge is, is is exactly as you showed in the clip. We, you know, whenever we start to talk about spending money on social care, people start to raise issues of fairness and intergenerational burden and all of these kind of things. But I don't think we ever get to the nub of the debate, really. So if we want to talk about fairness, we've currently got a system that's rife with cross subsidy that has 1.6 million people waiting for care because the eligibility criteria is so high. We've got 8 million unpaid carers who are not getting the assessments that they need. Lots of people who are wanting to live independently in the community and can't get the care and support they need. And that's the discussion we need to have with the general public, not one which the politicians have made so narrow about people having to sell their homes for the cost of care. And that's, I'm not belittling that problem at all. But once you start to make it into such a narrow sort of cohort of people who people think will be right. supported, then you're not going to get a proper debate about social care and it affects all of us. James, where is the, the general public on this one now? Have we shifted? I think we have shifted. I mean, if we look over the last 10 years, uh, back in 2009, people generally said they wanted to see spending uh, um, cuts to sort of fund um, some of these some of these elements of the NHS and social care in other areas. Now that has really moved on to tax increases. Now I expect that one of the government one of the elements of the government's thinking about this one percent national insurance rise is that in the research I've done, I'm sure in the research that the government's seeing in terms of when they go out and speak to the public, is that it is quite popular. 
Yes, it's more popular with older people because they don't have to pay it, but it's also popular amongst younger people. And in the focus groups that I've done, people feel that national insurance is fairer. They feel it's more likely to go to the NHS and social care, and therefore they feel like their money is less likely to be wasted. So those political considerations, I'm sure, are behind this decision. You just heard Andrew Dillnott say he thought that older, wealthier people, those who could afford to pay for it, should be included. Do you think the government would, would take that um, you know, to the people? Would, would that be electorally too dangerous? I think that if it were targeted, I think one of the key things the public always sort of um, look for in this is a sense that, that perhaps the people who are who have a little bit more earnings of higher income are paying more in. So that's certainly an element. I think the danger is, is if some Tory MPs are talking about the idea of a tax just for over 40s. Um, again, we tested that when I was at Downing Street and since. And the public really recoil against that. They feel like it's their parents and grandparents being punished um, for their hard work throughout their life. Even 18 to 24 year olds are heavily opposed to that policy. So I think in responding to the MPs over the summer, as they get closer to the autumn, the government also needs to make sure they don't go too far the other way, end up punishing the old rather than the young. Vic, how do you plan um, for this? I mean, within care homes, how do you actually plan for, for not really knowing whether there, there is or there will be a strategy? Or, or you could see a strategy implemented very quickly. Well, and I think that's the problem, because social care is a long-term challenge and what we've had repeatedly from governments is very very short-term fixes so it's really difficult for organizations to plan and particularly really difficult for organizations to think about how they innovate and change there's a massive digital re revolution that's needed within the social care sector but that requires investment there are new models of care that we know work really well mm -hmm. to support people to live independently particularly people with dementia that work really well and we're not able to invest in those buildings invest in those services and really important invest in that workforce and Sir Andrew mentioned that 1.6 million people working within social care and yet you know we most of those who are working on the front line are on minimum wage and, and that's a disgraceful position for the for the sector to be in really that must be tough and 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 just lastly to you James I mean is there a chance that Boris Johnson is hearing um, the murmurings of disquiet from his MPs but actually the the, the wider public is is much more where the, where the sort of spending would be? I think that probably is likely. I think there is, this is one of those issues where there is a big disjunction between where the MPs are and where the public are. I mean, let's look back to the March uh, at the budget where the Chancellor did announce tax rises. He announced a corporation tax rise and he, and he announced a freeze in personal allowances. In the March of that, MPs were very nervous, very worried, saying it was going to be the end of them forever. They were breaking their pledges to their constituents. Uh, their constituents. Actually, the Chancellor got that through and, it, and the public actually welcomed it and found it popular. I expect we might actually end up seeing something similar happen here. Thank you both very much. Thanks for coming in.